Thank you to the Science uh, um, Learning Institute um, and to Barbara for um, inviting me to be here. Um, I'm going to tell you about some of the research that I've done uh, concerning beliefs about ability and their influence on um, the ability of uh, uh, women and men, African American um, and, and white Americans to succeed in, in academia. Um, and before I start, I, I wanted to mention that even though this, uh, this work will expand to include uh, mention of, of race, we, we started it really uh, with a strong focus on gender. We thought that the processes that we are investigating pertain specifically uh, and could explain uniquely um, phenomena that had to do with gender. Um, but the more we thought about it, the more we realized that the, the phenomena were actually more general, the processes that we were invoking well, could actually explain more than we originally thought. And you actually see this progression uh, in the course of the talk where I will start with um, a strong focus on, on gender, but then it'll broaden uh, to include mention of race as well. Um, I also wanted to um, acknowledge before I start my um, sort of partner and co-conspirator in a lot of this work, Sarah Jane Leslie, who um, is a philosopher uh, at Princeton. So she and I, along with our students um, and other collaborators, have done a lot of this work together. Um, most broadly stated, what I'm interested in, in understanding is how to explain why some fields and some organizations um, reflect the gender and racial diversity of our um, society, um, and others still pretty much look like this. Uh, this is a, a physics conference from uh, 1927. Um, there's a single woman um, in attendance, uh, Marie Curie, right here. Um, and I'm sad to say, if you were to go to a physics conference um, today, in 2018, um, it wouldn't be uh, that different. Still, as of now, only about one in five uh, physics PhDs is, um, is a woman. So more generally, concerns about uh, diversity in women's underrepresentation um, have been at the forefront in uh, what are known as uh, STEM fields. So what I plotted here um, is data from uh, three STEM fields. STEM stands for, as you may uh, know, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, these are data from the uh, NSF, which they make publicly available on their website, unless there's a government shutdown, in which case you can't access their website, as I realized yesterday. Uh, <laughs> the, the funny things that uh, you notice about. Um, so here you see engineering, mathematics, and physics all have uh, uh, really sizable gender gaps. At the PhD level, only between 20 and 30 percent of uh, PhDs in these fields are, um, are women. However, and this is less uh, talked about, um, you also find uh, fields outside of STEM, outside of the sciences, um, that have gaps that rival in size. Um, the ones in, in STEM. So for example, I've, I've given three examples here, economics, music theory and composition, philosophy. Um, these are fields that, again, at the PhD um, have gender gaps that are of similar magnitude to the ones in, um, in psychology. So um, what gives? Why is it that you have gender gaps not just in these uh, fields that are often discussed, both in the literature and in the media, but also in um, other, uh, at least on the surface, very dissimilar uh, fields across all corners of um, academia. And of course, you can, and many people have, and there's a sizable literature on this, invoke field-specific explanations uh, for each of these gaps. So perhaps there's something about um, spatial skills, stereotypes about spatial skills that might explain why women aren't represented in engineering, or maybe there's something about mathematics that's holding women back in mathematics and physics, or maybe there's something music-specific that explains why there are fewer women in uh, music theory and composition. But what if, and this is a big what if, and this is what I'm going to try to spend the rest of my talk uh, telling you about and convincing you of, what if there, there are features of a field that apply across the board um, that might make a field um, unwelcoming uh, for, for women as well as members of, uh, of other groups? So this is the kind of story I want to tell today, the kind of hypothesis I want to propose today, that there is, in fact, a feature that applies across fields of academia that um, may be able to explain uh, the interesting uh, pattern of, of gender gaps. Um, so I'm, giving, I'm going to give you the punchline first and give you what the hypothesis is, um, and then I'll flesh it out a little bit and then go into the um, evidence for it. So the, at the core of the hypothesis is the idea that um, some fields more than others um, 
believe that in order to succeed levels um, in them, you need to have a spark of raw talent, something that can't be taught. Um, you have to have a spark of brilliance and genius. Um, and this is something that um, I'll show you um, evidence for, but it's likely that uh, this feature, which can easily apply to, uh, to any field uh, across academia because it's not content specific, could be a factor uh, that could make uh, a field less welcoming for women. And this is in part because our society still, uh, even well into the 21st century, associates these traits, these high level intellectual abilities with men so than women. And I'll propose to you today that it's the combination of these two factors that can explain a good portion of variability in women's uh, underrepresentation across a wide uh, swath of, of academia. So the combination of these two factors should actually explain women's underrepresentation both in STEM, there's variability across STEM fields in, in the extent to which women underrepresented, and um, outside of STEM in the social sciences and, and humanities. And after a lot of brainstorming, we, we had to come up with a name for this. Um, we came up with a field-specific ability beliefs hypothesis, which also has um, the desirable property of having the acronym FAB. Um, so let's just say a few more words about each of these components. The uh, brilliance and genius beliefs components is rooted in a long line of work uh, done by uh, Carol Dweck and her uh, collaborators, uh, which is really about spelling out the consequences of individuals' beliefs about ability. So if you talk with individual people and ask them, how do you get to be good at something? Where does ability come from? You see a range of responses that can be roughly uh, lined up on a continuum. At one end of a continuum, you have the idea that in order to be good at something, you have to have uh, something about you that you're born with that's stable, and that's often known as a fixed mindset. It's also known as an um, entity theory. Um, you pick your mindset, it feels a little bit more uh, intuitive. Uh, at the other end of the continuum, you have people who believe that um, with the right amount of effort, with passion, with dedication, you can actually improve even your most basic uh, abilities. Um, and obviously, uh, these are dramatized here. They're, they're sort of like caricatures. Most people fall somewhere uh, along this continuum. But this is a good illustration of the, the of a dimension that's widely represented um, out there in the world uh, with respect to individuals' beliefs about ability. So our idea is basically that this could uh, be abstracted to the level of entire uh, fields or organizations. So by analogy, we reason that perhaps disciplines as well, uh, like individuals, could fall along uh, uh, this uh, continuum of the extent to which they emphasize raw ability um, or innate talent. The idea being that it's specifically uh, the fields where beliefs about how you have this special uh, trait that enables you to succeed would be least welcoming to women's participation. So this is some intellectual uh, sort of heritage of this idea that there's variability between fields and their beliefs about success. Um, let's move on to the stereotypes. So this is a stereotype that you can probably all um, sort of relate to, have intuitions about. Let me just give you a few of my favorite and most depressing examples of these stereotypes um, in the 21st century sort of Western world. Uh, this is an article from the New York Times from 2014. Um, the author had access to anonymous Google searches that the par parents made about their, uh, their children. And he tallied them along two dimensions. How often did parents um, search with respect to their daughter's intellectual uh, traits? And how often they search with respect to their sons versus their daughters about physical traits? What we found, um, as you might expect, is that for every 10 searches about uh, daughters being gifted or brilliant, there were 25 searches about boys. So, two and a half times as many uh, searches about boys being gifted brilliant than, than about girls. And in reality, actually, this is not something that parents were looking out in the world were veridically perceiving, right? Plus a lot of these kids are really young kids, so it's unclear how you can tell. Uh, the, in reality, girls are overrepresented relative to boys in gifted and talented programs. Right? So these are uh, abstract expectations that parents are bringing to the table uh, and are um, sort of imputing in children's uh, behavior. 
the contrary, the, the converse finding was, uh, was obtained with respect to physical traits. So for every 10 searches about uh, sons being overweight, there are 17 searches about um, girls being overweight. And again, in reality, it's boys that are uh, more often overweight in the US than, uh, than girls are. So this is, again, not something that they were vertically picking up from uh, looking, looking around them. They searched for things like, is my daughter ugly? It's interesting to think about why uh, one would search that or how they expect Google to answer questions like that. Uh, but nevertheless, this is what parents do in the privacy of their homes, not expecting that anyone would actually tally their, uh, their searches and, and look at their content. Here's another example. This is a Gap ad from uh, 2016. If you can see, the boy is wearing an Einstein t-shirt and he's a little scholar. Your future starts here, shirts plus graphic tees equals genius. She, the girl, is of course a social butterfly. Her clothes are gonna be the talk of the, uh, the playground. I imagine that these companies have focus groups. So, you know, like I, I can't imagine the levels this went through and still was thought acceptable as a way of marketing uh, clothes to, uh, to children. Um, here's another example that might hit closer to home in some ways in an academic environment. You're all familiar, I expect, with the Rate My Professor, which is the site where undergrads go and, and read your performances as instructors. Uh, ben Schmidt, who's an, um, uh, an assistant professor of digital humanities at Northeastern, uh, was able to go on and scrape the text of the reviews and make it text searchable so that you too can go to this website um, and search for any particular word you want to search for. It'll give you a breakdown for men versus women across these fields. Go to this website and you search for terms like genius and brilliant is a bias toward males. Two to three times more often across all these fields here, these words that pertain to high-level intellectual ability are used uh, for for men relative to uh, to women. And this is not an overall bias. If you search for other superlatives like excellent or amazing, you actually get pretty close to gender parity. Uh, and of course, if you search for things like warm and caring, you get the flip, where women uh, are given these attributes more often than, uh, than men. So this seems to be a fairly specific bias such that men more so than women are associated with these high-level intellectual traits. So there seems to be in our society, to summarize, a, a pervasive association between men, not women, and high-level intellectual, high intellectual ability. And as a result, women may be discouraged from pursuing uh, careers whose members believe that you need exactly these traits that, are, that they're stereotyped to lack in order to, in order to succeed. So uh, coming back to this, this, is, uh, uh, this was just by way of providing a little bit more detail about where these uh, components are coming from. Um, let's move on and talk about the evidence. So what evidence do we have that it is, in fact, uh, fields in which beliefs about brilliance being important are most strongly endorsed that are the ones that have the biggest uh, gender gaps. In the first study we conducted to test this hypothesis, we surveyed uh, professors uh, and, and graduate students across three disciplines, both in STEM and in the social sciences and humanities. Um, uh, we ended up with a sample of about 1,800 of them. And we asked them a number of questions, uh, most important among which were questions about what they believe is required for success in their field. Um, so, for example, we had questions like being a top scholar of blank, and each person were asked, uh, was asked about their own field. So psychology would ask, uh, answer questions about psychology. Philosophers would uh, answer questions about philosophy. Okay. Uh, still works? Okay. Or works better, I should say. Uh, <laughs> Um, and then what we did is we averaged the responses within a person and across people in a field to derive a single number that tracked the extent to which people in that field believe that brilliance and, um, um, and, and high-level intellectual ability, innate, unteachable ability, was required for success in their, um, in their field. Um, and then we looked for relationships between that variable and uh, the proportion of PhDs in that field uh, that were women. And here's what we found. So first, I'm going to show you the graph for all three disciplines, both STEM and, and non-STEM. On the x-axis here, you have the field-specific ability beliefs variable. So higher numbers indicate greater emphasis on brilliance. And on the y-axis, you have the proportion of PhD, the percentage of PhDs who are um, women. 
Uh, and what you see is a very strong negative relationship. As predicted, the more a field emphasized these high-level innate intellectual traits, the fewer women obtained PhDs in, in that field. And the correlation was fairly high for social science correlations at negative uh, 0.6. One thing you might wonder right away, this is reviewer one, uh, to ad adopt David's uh, a strategy, is, well, maybe men have a higher emphasis on brilliance, because why not? They're positively stereotyped on this dimension, and there's more men here at this end of the continuum. Um, so maybe all you're looking at is a correlation between percentage of men and percentage of women, which would be sort of trivial and, and not interesting. But it turns out that if you uh, look at men's scores and women's uh, scores separately, you find the same relationships. And also when you derive a single score by averaging uh, the men's average and the women's average per field, you find exactly the same relationship. So it doesn't seem like this strong relationship is a sort of a, per a trivial byproduct of the proportions of men and women in these, in these fields. Uh, it's important for our account to also show that these relationships hold within STEM and within uh, social sciences and, and humanities. We want to make an account uh, that cuts across uh, the different sectors of academia. So um, indeed, we found that when you look just at the 12 STEM fields that we had in our survey, you find an equally strong relationship, negative uh, 0.64, and you find something similar when you look at social sciences and humanities as well, the relationship being a negative 0.62. So it does seem that this um, hypothesis that the emphasis on brilliance in the field predicts its uh, uh, representation of women uh, holds water not just across the entire field of um, academia, but also within these uh, slightly narrow subdomains. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but we're also interested in comparing uh, the predictive validity of our hypothesis against other hypotheses that have been offered to explain women's underrepresentation. So, for example, are women particularly likely to be un underrepresented in fields that require long hours? or in fields that are particularly selective. So we actually asked our participants a number of other questions to measure these additional variables as well. Um, and when we compare their ability to predict uh, the representation of women across fields, uh, the only variable that was actually significantly predictive above and beyond the others was this belief um, variable, which was um, striking to us. Um, as I mentioned before, even though we started with a strong focus on gender, later as we talked and thought uh, more about this, we realize that it's pretty much any group in our society that's stereotyped as lacking these high-level intellectual traits that should be underrepresented in fields that value brilliance, not just women. And African Americans are another salient group that's stereotyped in similar ways along this, along this dimension. Would we find a relationship between field-specific ability beliefs and African Americans' representation? And in fact, we do. So when you look at the percentage of PhDs in the field who are African American and you correlate that with field-specific ability beliefs, you find a relationship of similar magnitude that also holds when you take education out of the equation here, which is a little bit of an outlier in terms of African Americans' representation. At the same time, we want to do a little bit of discriminant validity, right? So we, we don't want the field-specific ability belief score to correlate with the representation of any group, even groups that aren't negatively stereotyped with respect to their intellectual abilities. So to do this, we uh, looked at Asian Americans who uh, aren't uh, stigmatized as having lower intellectual ability than, than other groups. And in fact, when you look at their representation, it's not significantly predicted by the emphasis of, uh, on brilliance in their, um, in their field. Um, I'm not going to go into detail uh, with this next um, paper, but I wanted to point you to it. Um, we have also more recently replicated these results with a more indirect measure of the emphasis on brilliance in the field. So what I told you about so far is basically the explicit responses of people in the field regarding what's required for, for success. But you can actually, going back to these data, you can count how often people in the field used uh, these terms, um, averaging across the men and women's scores, to derive a single count of the words like genius and brilliant, which is sort of an indirect proxy for how often undergrads in that field feel that others should be evaluated on the basis of these traits, which track, should track, the extent to which those traits are traits that you think others should be evaluated in that field. So what we did um, in this paper, we just used those simple word counts from this Rate My Professor data, and we were able to predict both women's and African Americans' representation across the fields in the Rate My Professor data set above and beyond all the other uh, competitor uh, variables which to me was sort of mind-boggling at the time. 
given how, how indirect this measure of uh, emphasis on brilliance is. Okay, so we have some evidence for there being a relationship between emphasis on brilliance and uh, women and African Americans under representation. Um, let's talk about mechanism. How is it that these beliefs might uh, make a field of homecoming for women? How is it that these beliefs might make it such that uh, they don't succeed at the same, they don't persist or succeed at the same levels as, um, as men? I'm gonna tell you some evidence. We have a number of lines of work going um, along these lines. I'll tell you about three potential mechanisms. Perhaps in fields that have higher emphasis on brilliance, members of groups that are stigmatized as not possessing brilliance might feel like imposters, might feel like they've gone as far as they've gone by sheer luck without really having the ability that it takes to succeed and that any moment now they're gonna be discovered. Uh, this actually tracks lower persistence and lower success um, in a field more generally, so we were interested in it as a mediator here, as a, as a mechanistic variable. Um, it's also possible that in fields that emphasize brilliance, members of groups that are stigmatized as not possessing brilliance might feel like they don't belong, like they're not respected by others, like they, they're not valued by others, like they're not part of the community of the field, which again is a strong predictor of whether uh, you will pursue uh, this field in the long term. And perhaps messages about the importance of brilliance to success might actually work to undermine women's interest to the extent that people around you talk about how brilliant you need to be to get a job in this field. That could undermine um, your um, interest to pursue uh, this field for a number of reasons that we can get into in the, in the Q&A as well. Uh, so let's talk about these first two mechanisms first because they're addressed in the context of this, uh, uh, the uh, single study. This is a study that's spearheaded by uh, Melis Lordoglu, who's one of my students. Um, and it's a study that's still in progress. We have about 1,300 respondents, so I feel comfortable showing you these results. Uh, but uh, it's still something uh, that we're sort of working on because, well, I'll tell you because why uh, in a second. Um, so here in this study, we contacted, again, professors, postdocs, uh, uh, and graduate students across a whole bunch of fields here. There are actually more fields. We included medical fields in the, uh, in the mix as well. And we asked them not just the field-specific ability beliefs variable, like what do you think is required for success in your field, but also measures of uh, whether they feel like imposters. So this is a sample item. I'm afraid that people important to me may find out, find out that I'm not as capable as they think I am. So hopefully this captures, this is a well-validated uh, well scale uh, developed by Clans in the 80s. This captures the, uh, the feeling of being an imposter. Um, we also measure their sense of belonging. I feel like I'm part of the community of my field. I feel accepted by others, I feel respected by others. And then we looked for whether um, these variables might differ for men and women for underrepresented minorities versus whites uh, or non-underrepresented uh, non minorities uh, across fields as a function of their emphasis on brilliance. So these graphs are gonna get a tiny bit more complicated, but let me set up the stage, uh, set the stage first. So we're gonna have four uh, graphs here in this two by two. On the left hand, you're gonna see graphs for students and postdocs. We're interested in whether these relationships vary by career stage. It's possible that students and postdocs will be quite different than faculty in their, uh, and how they look on these variables. Uh, so we have students and faculty, and on uh, the horizontal we have uh, non-underrepresented non minorities, so this is m m mostly white and, and Asian participants, and this is underrepresented minorities. And these are about 3,600 participants at seven R1 universities. Uh, so we're looking at a sense of being an imposter first, higher values are worse. You feel more like an imposter. So here's what we see. I'm gonna show you non-URM, so this is whites uh, and Asians first. Um, what you see first is, Students and postdocs experience more uh, sense of being an imposter than faculty. That's pretty sensible, so it's good. Um, women, it's good in a sense of um, uh, validating our measures, not good in an overall sense. <laughs> um, <coughs> women experience overall more of it than men. There's also a relationship with field-specific ability beliefs, such that the higher the emphasis on brilliance, the more generally people experience these uh, feelings of being an imposter. But importantly, there's also a, a, an interaction with gender, such that for both students uh, and postdocs and faculty, the slope with fab is positive. For even for more senior women, faculty women, the, 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 the emphasis on brilliance in the field is associated with a sense of being an imposter. Whereas for men, it flattens out. Faculty men 
no longer care whether they're in a high emphasis on brilliance or low emphasis on brilliance field with respect to their sense of being an imposter. Here's what we find with respect to um, <clears throat> underrepresented minorities. Uh, generally similar patterns. However, you can see that the underrepresented minority women faculty exhibit a, an exaggerated slope. So it's almost like an additive effect here. They get a double whammy from being a minority and being a woman, and this slope is huge. And I actually checked this, this slope is not a byproduct of outliers. This is actually a, a real valid um, a slope here. Um, and this is the reason why we want to collect more data. We only have about 100 people in this particular cell here. So we want to collect more data so that we're even more confident in our inferences here. But overall, these data do suggest the sense of being an imposter, maybe one of the uh, mechanisms that's involved here, insofar as women and underrepresented minorities experience more of these uh, negative feelings in fields that are high emphasis on brilliance. Similar story for belonging. You have to flip here, belonging higher is better. You have more of a sense of belonging. Um, generally, uh, faculty belong more than students. Men feel like they belong more than women. Generally, there is a downward slope with field-specific ability beliefs. Most people feel like they belong less, the more emphasis on, a, on brilliance there is in their field, but even more so for women. So for, again, for men, the slope kind of flattens out. It's significant and negative for more junior folks, but it kind of flattens out to non-significance for faculty, whereas for women, it stays the same. And again, for, uh, this is for non-URMs. For URMs, you see that the largest slope of all of these slopes is for the uh, faculty women of, uh, of color. Right? So again, if a sense of belonging is, again, potentially a mechanism by which uh, these emphasis on brilliance types of beliefs um, lead to lower representation of African Americans and uh, actually more generally underrepresented minorities and, and women in academia. The range for the scale is one to seven, so that's the entire range. So um, one would be um, extremely, I, I strongly agree, oh, sorry, like strongly disagree, and seven would be strongly agree, right? With statements like, I feel valued by others, I feel respected by others, I feel like I belong with others in my field. So one to seven is the entire range of possible variability, a one point difference is actually pretty huge um, in, in, with respect to the general range of variability on these things. Any other question, clarification questions with respect to this, since we're, okay. Um, interest, does interest also suffer among, uh, among women with respect uh, to fields that are described in terms that emphasize, uh, emphasize brilliance? Um, this is also the first piece of experimental evidence we have. So most of the data I've shown you so far um, is observational, it tracks relationships between variables. Here we're also interested in manipulating how a field is described in order to see whether um, men and women's um, interest in it vary accordingly. So what we did is we described to participants uh, an unfamiliar uh, major. We started with STEM majors because that's where gender gaps are uh, generally largest. We told them there's a new interdisciplinary major that combines disciplines across the natural sciences and engineering. Um, and uh, we then randomly assigned participants to one of two conditions that kind of mimics the ends of the FAB uh, continuum. So in one condition, uh, participants were told that uh, the faculty in this new major were interviewed and the top five adjectives that came out of these interviews were brilliant, intelligent, talented, smart, and respectful as a filler. Whereas in the other condition, they were told that the adjectives were dedicated, hardworking, motivated, passionate, and respectful. The idea here is that perhaps messages about the importance of brilliance to success might be particularly detrimental to women, such that when they hear these messages, their interest suffers uh, relative to uh, this comparison condition um, in the context of the same exact activity. Right? So it's the same exact activity they're being told about, but described in these two different ways. Uh, we measured their interest. Um, across these studies, we have both um, undergrads and mechanical turkers, uh, and we didn't want to presume that they're looking for a major or a job or an internship. We asked about all these things across different studies. So we asked in a sort of like a hypothetical way, assuming you're looking for, to declare a major, how likely would you be to declare this one? Assuming you're looking for a career, how likely would you be to consider a career in this field, uh, and so on. 
So what we see is the predicted interaction. When you look at women's scores across the brilliance and dedication condition, their interest in this interdisciplinary unfamiliar STEM major is lower relative to the dedication condition, whereas for the men, it's not significantly in the, um, in the opposite direction. Uh, we have a number of controls and so on that I'm happy to go into in the Q&A if you're interested. Uh, we replicated this finding with respect to the social sciences and humanities. Remember, our account is supposed to be general. It's supposed to account for underrepresentation, not just in STEM, but across other segments of academia. And in fact, we find the same pattern. When you describe, when you do exactly the same study, but you describe the majors being uh, integrating across many fields in the social sciences and humanities, you get the same pattern of findings with messages about brilliance undermining women's interest in this, in this field. You find the same thing when you leave the content of the major unspecified, when you tell people about an internship, when you tell people about a job. And in this study, I'm singling out because we also have uh, an important baseline condition here. So with a pairwise differences between brilliance and dedication, you might think, well, maybe it's the messages about dedication that are particularly appealing to women. How do you know it's the messages about brilliance that are detrimental to their interest? But what we see here is that when we include a, ba a baseline, a control condition with some neutral traits about the, you know, like office-related traits that are included here that just serve, intended to serve as sort of a, a neutral baseline, you see that it's the brilliance condition that's lower than the other two rather than the dedication condition being higher than the other two. So this sort of cl clarifies what's doing the causal work here and pinpoints the messages about brilliance as being the culprits uh, undermining women's um, interests. So um, being a developmental psychologist, the next step for me um, was to look at development as well. If you're interested in intervening and trying to make fields more welcoming on the basis of these findings, it's likely that intervening on college students who've, um, or even later graduate students who've held these beliefs for uh, some time may not be the most effective. You're sort of fighting, an, uh, an, you're climbing uphill, uh, whereas if these beliefs arise early and you intervene early, that would be a, a much more effective way of preventing some of these um, noxious patterns from developing. So uh, with respect to developing, uh, development, we're interested in two questions in particular. When do you see the stereotypes that associate brilliance with men more than women um, emerge? And when do they start tracking the kinds of things that boys and girls are interested um, in doing, which is um, sort of the precursor to these career outcomes that we see uh, in adults. So let's take each question in term, where do these stereotypes, when do these stereotypes uh, develop? Um, the first study that we did on this, this were, these are children from Champaign-Urbana, um, Illinois. We recruited um, 96, five, six, and, and seven-year-olds. We started with five as the youngest age because that's the youngest age at which others have identified intellectually relevant stereotypes, like stereotypes about mathematics, so we thought it was a good um, starting point a priori. Uh, we measured stereotypes in a, a number of ways. You have to be careful here with kids in this age range. You can't ask them, who do you think is brilliant? Who do you think is smarter, boys versus girls? This is the cooties age, you know, their gender. If you ask it that way, their gender is superior to the other gender in all possible respects. So we had to ask about gender without asking about gender, which you'll see, you will see in a second. So here's an example of how we did this. We told them a story about a person who's really, really smart. There are lots of people at the place where I work, but there's one person who's really, really special. This person's really, really smart. This person figures out how to do things quickly and comes up with answers much faster and better than anyone else. This person's really, really smart. You can tell I've spent a lot of time with four-year-olds. Uh, <coughs> so then we'd simply ask them, here are a bunch of people. Which one do you think is the person in the story? This is important because we, we don't mention the, uh, the gender of the person who's really smart in this story, right? So this is a totally gender neutral story um, and we can catch them in the act of having the stereotype or not by tracking how often they choose men versus women as being the protagonists of this story. To the extent that people uh, choose, that, that children choose men, uh, they should be uh, more likely to um, have endorsed, have learned uh, the stereotype that associates brilliance with men. What we did here is actually kept track of how often kids chose members of their own uh, gender, and that's how I'll present the data as well. Here's another task, very similar. One of these two is a really, really smart person. Can you guess which one's really, really smart? And here we showed them the, the trials that we're interested in, were trials of people with, uh, of different gender. 
However, we started off with a bunch of trials of people of the same gender to kind of like lull kids into thinking that this is about individuals, not about gender, right? so for the same reason I mentioned before. Um, so here's what we found. I'll plot on the y-axis the proportion of choosing their own gender as being really, really smart. Um, and on the x-axis here, we have five-year-olds, six-year-olds, and, um, and seven-year-olds. And what you see is something quite interesting. At five, you only see in-group bias. You see basically like kids choosing their own gender as being really, really smart. Although already at six and seven, you see differences such that boys are significantly more likely to choose members of their own gender as being really, really smart uh, than, uh, than girls are. So this, there's a significant dip here between five and six uh, for, uh, for the girls. So this may be sort of the, the beginning uh, traces of the stereotype that we see in adults, including in American adults, for example, Googling about their uh, children online. However, you may think, okay, so these are kids from Champaign-Urbana, it's like 96 kids, mostly white. To what extent does this characterize, let's say, American kids, right? And those claims are hard to make. However, having just moved to NYU, I figured this is a good opportunity to get some evidence with respect to the generalizability uh, of these findings. So this is an, uh, an in-progress study with Jelana Boston, my graduate student, being the lead person on it. We have so far 199 kindergartners and first graders in New York City, public schools, majority um, Latinos, so the biggest uh, group is Latinos. Um, the data are going to be plotted a little bit differently here with age as a continuous variable because we took everyone in kindergarten and first grade, so we couldn't select by uh, neat age bins. Uh, so here's what we find. Broadly similar. So the, the age axis goes from four and a half to seven and a half. Girls go from choosing girls as being really, really smart. The, the task was exactly the same as the one I showed you before. Girls go from choosing girls about 70% of the time to 50% uh, and actually below, they did below here in, um, in this sample. Um, starting at about the age of six, there's a significant difference between the extent to which boys choose boys and girls choose girls as being really, really smart, which is exactly what we've seen before as well. The slight twist here is that boys actually don't start favoring boys. And in fact, the extent to which they think that boys are really, really smart increases over the course of this uh, period. Here's the data plotted a slightly different way. So you can look at um, overall percentage of choosing men as being really, really smart across boys and girls. And when you see uh, the error bars not crossing the, the midline, the 50%, then kids in this group endorse the brilliance equals men stereotype. And here's what we find, and these are confidence intervals. So when the confidence interval no longer crosses the, the midline, uh, then on, uh, children are significantly above uh, the midpoint. They're significantly um, endorsing the brilliance equals men stereotype. And what you see is that right around six and a half, um, kids start associating significantly more often than chance uh, being really, really smart with, uh, with men. And this is from you know, a part of the country that's quite different from Champaign-Urbana, um, Illinois. More urban, uh, more diverse, about as different as you can get. So this speaks well to the generalizability of these, uh, of these findings. We're also interested in the sources of this stereotype, right? So why uh, is it that kids get these beliefs in their head? Um, and one place you might look to is school, right? So do kids think that boys do better in school than girls? That's, if you think about it rationally, that's a good source of information about who's really, really smart. Being smart should enable you to do well in school. So uh, this is back to the sample from Champaign-Urbana. We asked kids, who do you think has the best grades in school? Who do you think is first in their class? And they had to select uh, a kid from uh, uh, pictures of unfamiliar children. And what you see here is quite different. Girls choose other girls as being really good at school and being first in their class about 90% of the time across five, six, and seven. Let me put these side by side for you. Here are the girls on the question about who's really, really smart. Here are the girls on the question about who gets really good grades. There's no relationship between those two uh, variables. So at a, yearly, uh, a really young age, girls are starting to discount the value of doing well in school as an index of who, uh, who is smart. And we can talk in the Q&A about why that might, uh, that might be. Um, last uh, set of studies, and I'll go through them quickly. Do these stereotypes matter? Do we see that they relate to the kinds of things boys and girls are interested in? 
In this first study, we recruited six and seven year olds. So these are kids at the ages at which we already see an association between uh, brilliance and men specifically. Um, and we introduced them on, uh, following a similar logic to the adult studies, we introduced them to unfamiliar games that we described as being either for kids who are really, really smart or for kids who try really, really hard. And we swapped and we counterbalanced these descriptions with the particular games um, such that there isn't anything about the content of the game that would drive children's um, inferences. Uh, we asked them uh, about their interest for these games. So for example, we asked them, would you want to play the Zarki game? Do you like the Zarki game? Imagine you're playing it. Would you feel happy or sad? Um, and so on. So we average these, and because they're on different scales, we also had to standardize them, so the average is going to be zero in the next graph I'll show you. And here's what we find. So remember, this is a, a study in which we recruited uh, children at the ages of six and seven after the, the developmental point at which children seem to be endorsing stereotypes associating brilliance with men. When these games were described as being for kids who are really, really smart, girls were significantly less interested in them than boys were when, uh, in, uh, when the same games were described as being for kids who are hardworking, who try really, really hard, there's no difference between boys and girls. So again, it wasn't anything about the content of these specific games that drove boys and girls' preferences. It was the description of the game as being for kids who are uh, really, really smart. And in addition, uh, in this study, we also measure the extent to which kids associate brilliance with men more than women. And that predicted uh, the gender differences you saw with particularly the girls who are more likely to associate brilliance with men being the ones who showed less interest in these, uh, in these games. The last prediction here, okay, so we looked at six and seven year olds. What if we look at five and six year olds, right? So at five, we didn't see any trace of an association between brilliance and, and men. So if we recruited five and six year olds and we asked them uh, about the game for kids who are really, really smart, you should see a difference. You should see no difference at five and a significant difference at uh, six. So that's what we did in this study. We recruited 96 five and six year olds. Um, the prediction, we only showed them the smart game because that's the, the one about we had our about which we had our crucial predictions. Uh, and the prediction here is that five-year-olds should show no difference um, and six-year-olds should show a difference. And in fact, that's what we found. So at the age of five, when told about this new game, this for kids who's really, who are really, really smart, uh, there's no difference between boys and girls. If anything, numerically, girls had slightly higher interest scores than, uh, than boys. Whereas at six, you see the same flip or the same difference, I should say, um, as you saw in the preceding study with girls being significantly less interested in this game for kids who are really smart uh, than boys are. So it seems that starting at around the age of six, girls' attitudes towards um, activities that are said to require a lot of smarts uh, are more negative than boys. And of course, we uh, as scientists, we're not interested in how they think about the Zarki game and the Impact game specifically, uh, but rather are more interested in uh, their equivalents uh, uh, in the real world. So when children are exposed to the idea that physics or engineering requires a lot of smarts, are they going to show similar differences uh, with respect to their interests? So if you, and if you think about how early some of these beliefs and attitudes set in, we're talking about six-year-olds here, then you can actually, over time, you can end up with a pretty sizable cumulative difference in actual skills between boys and girls if girls haven't taken advantage of opportunities along the way to, um, to engage with these activities. So finally, implications. Um, and this is the part of the uh, talk that um, I'm going to skimp on because we have a Q&A and we can uh, speculate there. And also because at this point it's just speculations. right? So we're still in the thick of doing the basic empirical work. And um, what I'll say sort of follows pretty straightforwardly as a, uh, a practical recommendation, but I'm not sure that at this point I feel comfortable making too concrete uh, a recommendation uh, on the basis of these findings because we haven't uh, uh, empirically validated these suggestions. So, I mean, one straightforward thing that follows with respect to remedying some of the gender gaps uh, that exist both in STEM and outside of STEM is a shift in, in message, right? That to the extent that members of fields that are looking to um, increase their female representation, their African-American representation, change the messages that are sent to their students and other aspiring members uh, from, uh, well, only the brilliant few will get jobs in this field 
to, you know, everyone needs to work their hardest in order to succeed. Whether or not um, uh, brilliance and genius is, uh, is important, you need to put in the hours and you need to be passionate about it, so you need to give it your all in order to succeed. And we know that these messages work well for everyone, both men and women, both white people and black people. These are messages that are not only likely to be beneficial and adaptive for everyone, but also more likely to make the environments of many fields welcoming for members of groups that are stereotyped on these, um, on these dimensions. Of course, many thorny issues can arise when you actually start talking to members of particular disciplines about these issues. Some people really believe that these, uh, these beliefs are true. Uh, and you know, for all we know, they may actually be right that some fields require more of these traits than, than others. Um, it's important to understand that the, the, this talk and this program of research is neutral as to the truth of these beliefs. Ours is more of a sort of a public health message Whatever the truth of the belief is, it's important to realize that given the current stereotypes in our society, these beliefs have verbalized are still going to affect women differently than men, black people differently than white people, and are going to make the environment of your field or your classroom uh, more or less welcoming depending on uh, one's group membership. Um, that's it. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. An anecdote uh, and then a question. Um, I was at um, Google a couple of years ago at their SciFu thing, and there was a committee um, on women in in physics and graduate students. And there was an astronomer there. I think he was from Emory University, and they published a paper in Nature, and it was the and Nature, the journal, after the paper was accepted, contacted the professor, a man, a white man, because the author was a young black woman. And Nature they was- thought it was a mistake? And, well, no, 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 okay. no, 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 no. Nothing is terrible that with that. But, okay. but the, the, the journal apparently was really interested because this was the first black woman who published a paper in uh, astrophysics um, in, in Nature. And the committee that I was on at, at, at Google at this meeting, uh, the, the astronomer was there, and they launched a program trying to get women and minorities to go into these subjects. And it was very interesting, and I wanted to ask your opinion on this now, it's changing to a question, mm -hmm. um, that they had a lot of data showing that when it came to the GRE scores, that minorities and women were, were significantly underperforming the men who were getting into these programs. Um, and their solution was to, quite rightly, I think, that there are many other traits. Grit was, was, was coming into then, right, about doing well in these subjects. Um, so I wanted to ask you, one, do you think that there's going to be a need to um, select on other traits other than these quantified exams? Um, because there was still a dissociation there, and they had, and, and two, even if the belief were true that you could quantify ability in the hard sciences better than the humanities, it could still be due to your mechanism because you just need practice to get there. Gauss, famously, Carl Friedrich Gauss, when he was asked about his abilities in math, and he wasn't trying to be modest, said, I was just doing it hours and hours and hours and hours mm -hmm. since I was actually, funnily enough, about five years, four or five years old. So just to be clear, you know, do we need to... A, do something about the GREs, and you've got a slide there, that's great. And do you think it could still be due to the bias because you just need to get the time to practice on these more quantifiable things, and we just let the boys practice more than the girls on these things? Yeah, so let me start with the last one. I think that's exactly what I would think, right? So you take the GRE when you're, what, 22, 23. By that point, as a woman, you will have been in a culture that already associates math ability and, and sort of dissuades women from <coughs> participating in this field, right? So the fact that your scores as a woman are lower than the average man's could, it's not a measure of ability, right? It's a, it's a contaminated measure of something like current skill that's con contaminated by, in fact, some of the very same processes that we're talking about here, right? 
Um, so that's the first point. The other point is that even when you take GRE scores into account, so that's the analysis that I put up there. So this is pretty much the same regression analysis that I had before, except we also, you can get average GRE scores per discipline from ETS. They publish them online freely. So you can add GRE scores as an additional control in your, in your regression to see whether it's variability in GRE scores rather than these field-specific ability beliefs that predicts women's representation. And in fact, it doesn't. I mean, the, the match GRE is not significant. It's, it's got a high coefficient, but again, um, the only variable that's significant is the beliefs. And probably at least part of the math GRE coefficient there is in part a result of some of the same processes that we're talking about here. Okay. Sorry, this is a partial? This is a regression where everything is put in together as, pre as predicting uh, women's representation. Right, is it a straight regression or a partial regression? It's a partial regression, isn't it? Um, it's a multiple, I'm, I'm not sure what a partial regression, you mean partial uh, correlation or? Each, each line is, is controlled for all other lines? Yes. Yeah, so math and vertebral are eating each other up. If yeah, so. Just a combined GRE, that would be significant. Uh, I actually have, so I can show you, I have a table in, so somebody wrote a commentary on our first science paper saying it's all about math. And I can send you a table that has about 24 different models where you include different combinations of these, including just the math GRE, for example. Um, and pretty much the only thing that's significant consistently across the board is the ability belief. I, uh, I think there is much to be explored still to what qualifies brilliance. Mm -hmm. And I would argue your study started at five, at five years old. <laughs> Thank you very much. I wonder if you've considered even studying groups before that in daycares, uh, co-ops, parents and children, of how those perceptions, and stereotypes, and biases start so much sooner than, than really five. So it's interesting because that, that's what I would have thought too, that some of these, some of the same beliefs you might find in younger children as well. But I just wanted to pull up, so in this a study that is currently ongoing in New York City where we're looking at these stereotypes about brilliance, we actually do have slightly younger children, right? Because we're, we're taking anyone that's in kindergarten and some of them because of weird cutoff rules in New York City are actually just four. And what you see here that's kind of interesting is, oh actually maybe the next one, the next slide would be a better illustration of this, is that before five, you actually see significant bias in favor of women on these questions. So there's a, there's a crossover with respect to the 50% line. Here, you can see here better. Um, this, these are confidence intervals. So what you see before five here is actually kids, on average, choosing women to be significantly more often to be really, really smart than they're choosing men. And I know this is just a small sliver of what we see below five, but it was interesting to me and something that I hadn't seen before that suggests that um, there is real development here. That these, you know, like, then development really just does happen around the age of five, which kind of raises the question about what is it about five and what's going on. But um, at least with respect to brilliance, there's nothing that I've seen in my data that would suggest that it extends beyond that downward in development, yeah. I guess what I meant to say also was the influence of that environment, the perception of all of the adults that are dealing with <coughs> these children of how they are imposing their view mm -hmm. of the stereotypes and biases in, in these children who become more vulnerable to, at the age of five or four, to okay. have that self-perception because throughout their early years, uh, that is the, the environment that implicitly it, it was there, but it was not maybe so obvious. Possibly, yeah. So that, that's a possible explanation. So they've kind of like been sensitized to these ideas, and then something, you know, like something more specific input gives rise to this stereotype in the way that we're seeing here after five. Or Maybe it is something, you know, like maybe exposure, consistent exposure to kindergarten or, you know, like this is the first time that kids are really stepping outside of the, the home and being exposed to cultural messages. Maybe there is less, yeah. Well, daycare is, yeah, so you're right. So it, it would be interesting to look at the younger kids and variability in terms of their exposure to um, um, home versus more center-based care, yeah. So, this is the, our next big step here is trying to figure out, sort of chart the development of these stereotypes across this interesting transition from four and a half to, to six. 